From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It's 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on Wednesday, February 2nd. Here are the top market stories we are following for you at this hour. An A for Alphabet. The Google parent crushes estimates thanks to the cloud, YouTube, and a resilient advertising business. It sets the stage for Meta's report after the bell today. Pumping it up, OPEC Plus keeps the status quo and agrees to another 400,000 barrels a day output hike for March. Brent crude still dancing around $90. And contingency planning. The U.S. and its allies have approached several gas importers about sending fuel to Europe if a conflict over Ukraine erupts. We'll have more on that Bloomberg scoop, plus dig into the cybersecurity issues at play in the crisis with the CEO of Cato Networks. From New York, I'm Kaylee Lines with Guy Johnson in London. Alex Steele is off today. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Guy, happy Groundhog Day. It's an up day for the market. Yep. We can thank Alphabet for a lot of that, though. You wonder what Phil is going to have to say about the weather going forward. It's certainly been fairly <laughs> inclement of late. And certainly, I think, in Texas, they're looking forward to a cold spell. Um, yeah, Alphabet, I, I can't work out whether or not the stock is up on, on the numbers, which, as you say, were super strong. I, YouTube, I thought, was fairly mixed, but, but certainly the search story, as you say, absolutely crushed it. Or is it the stock split? Mm. It, I, in, in the past, that has worked. And opening the stock up to more retail investors certainly has been a great strategy of late uh, for other tech companies. But I think this is just part of the wider narrative, Kaylee, which is that tech seems to be coming back super fast. And I think we've already retraced half of the move down that we saw in the NASDAQ. So that is a breathtaking pace in terms of the recovery that we're seeing here. So the question of the day, um, and it's a fairly straightforward one, is big tech back? Let's talk about it. Ed Ludlow joining us from San Francisco. Kriti Gupta in New York alongside Kaylee. Ed, let me bring you in. Right. Alphabet certainly stealing the spotlight today. But if you take a look at the charts over the last few days, things really started to turn around with Apple. Can we thank yes. Apple for all of this? Yeah, I think that, you know, when you're in San Francisco covering this industry, you have the privilege of, of looking at technology broadly, right? We refer to big tech, but all of these guys have different business models, right? Advertising now is in play with um, uh, Alphabet and Google, Meta tonight, Apple with hardware and devices. But I think if you look across the S&P 500, across the NASDAQ 100, We've had strong beats, but also bullish outlooks, particularly from the semiconductor companies, right? Everyone from AMD to NXP um, has done well. Intel is a slight exception to that because they are in growth mode, which has impacted profitability. But the thing that kind of keeps jumping back to me as I read the transcripts from earnings is how concerned are any of these companies with the macro picture? It doesn't really seem to matter. Well, and is the micro picture better for some tech companies versus others? Creedy, we tend to talk about tech in this very broad basket, but it seems that there's starting to be a bit of a differentiation within this market. Yeah, there absolutely is. I mean, Ed nailed it, the idea that there are different business models at the end of the day, but it does still trade as a bundle at the end of the day. And you've heard portfolio manager yeah. after portfolio manager say this is a key part of the equation. If you actually look historically, valuations are cheap now. They're actually way, way better yeah. than they were, say, just two years ago, and that's really going to be a game changer for a lot of people who've been looking to buy into tech and have said, well, they continue to rise. But to Ed's point, the idea that some of the steam perhaps from the macro side is being pulled out of tech, well, that's really crucial because the spark that kind of lit the correction we've seen the last few weeks was Apple at $3 trillion. But Critty, multiples are, are reasonable if you compare them with the market. But if you take a look at pre-pandemic, these are multiples that have expanded sort of across the board. And the question that often gets asked of big tech is, is it defensive? And if you take a look at the multiples, you could argue versus the market, then maybe there is something to that. And if you take a look, as Ed says, at the earning capacity and the ability of these firms uh, to sidestep the macro headwinds that the rest of the economy is facing. But it comes back to this central question. Is this area defensive? If we're going into a volatile period driven by the macro, is this an area I can hang out? And I think that we don't know the answer to yet. What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, well, I would agree with you, but then let me give you the counterpoint of that. The idea here, and I'm going to go historically here, because there was a time when value was considered the defensive play, the idea that investing in the U.S. economy, industrials, energy, even brands like Coca-Cola was the defensive play. Now I think you can say that about Apple simply as a function, not just of the fact that they are kind of a proxy for the consumer uh, growth that you're seeing in the United States and around the world, the idea that you're spending your disposable income on these luxury products, but also the key point that we've heard about in the last year, right? Supply chain issues, pricing power. And it's that pricing power equation that makes big tech in particular, even the companies like Alphabet uh, and, and Meta Platforms that are a little bit more exposed to the cyclical side. But it's the pricing power that really sets them aside and really become, makes them that defensive play. All right, Ed, Creedy just name checked Meta. So let's go there. They report after right. the bell tonight. What's the read through from Alphabet to them? Yeah, so I think we see Meta higher uh, today, right? I think Snap is also higher. So you take a look at Alphabet, strong, broad ad business. Sales growth in ads was up 33%, right? Does that translate to Meta? There's a key point of differentiation. For a long time, we've been focused on how Meta and the Facebook platform is more vulnerable to the ad tracking or privacy changes that Apple made. That's one thing. Has there been impact there that has, has hurt the top line? The other thing is, you know, Sundar Pichai spoke quite candidly about the regulatory risk. Every quarter I come on this show and Guy Johnson asks me, what is the regulatory risk to big tech? And I say, oh, well, Guy, investors are very sanguine about this. It doesn't seem to be priced into the share price or it is priced in and no one's that worried. You do start to wonder as we have a fresh agenda for 2022, if we now start to talk about regulatory risk, because Sundar Pichai was compelled to talk about it. And if he was, and there's already an antitrust cloud over Facebook or parent company Meta, you do wonder if that's a theme for this year and this quarter. Be interesting to see exactly whether or not that story finally comes to fruition, because as you say, Ed, we've been talking about it for quite some time. I want to address the other issue which we're focused on today, particularly when it comes to Alphabet, this stock split. I don't yeah. know whether the stock is up today on the great numbers that they posted, particularly in search, or because of the stock split. What are your thoughts, Ed? It depends who you believe about the rationale. Ruth Porat told, the CFO told Bloomberg that this is about making the stock accessible. And I think it's uh, Brian Novak at Morgan Stanley, yes, that said, look at this spot stock split as the bigger picture. Alphabet and Google have already done a lot of investor or shareholder friendly stuff, right? They've been pretty t transparent about disclosures. They've been more active on the ESG front on returns. And he actually says this might put a little bit of pressure on Amazon now because there is a battle for the attention of investors, for investor capital. And Amazon may now feel compelled to act in a similar way um, as, as, as Alphabet has done. I, I mean, stock splits have not really been in fashion, right? If you think back to 2006, 2007, fantastic story on the Bloomberg about how there were dozens of stock splits at that time. We've had some big names do it, Tesla, Apple, Alphabet, some of the semiconductor companies. Um, the price is so high, I think based on Tuesday's close, this stock split will take the stock down to $138 a share. How interested is the retail investor in this company? They seem to, to the, you know, the reaction seems to be that there is demand for this stock. I just don't understand the read through from the retail investor's perspective. Well, Creedy, obviously 2021 and really the pandemic era more broadly was the era of the retail investor right. coming in full force at this market. They have had a rough go of it so far this year. I mean, what is their activity like now? Yeah, well, let's just talk about the fact that retail has actually been buying this entire time, even in the past couple of weeks when you saw, see the broader market, hedge funds in particular drive some of that selling. Retail consistently goes into market and buys, but they're not doing it in the same volume that you saw, say, a year ago and moving the markets in that way. What I think is interesting about what Ed is trying to say is that a lot of these big tech companies, well, they're trying to target the retail investor, right? So if you are bullish on retail making a bigger and bigger kind of stand in the market, then you should be bullish on tech as well, because now they do actually have access to a lot of these stocks that they didn't even just a year ago. One thing we learned, they do have the power to be a force in this market. Thank, Thank you. you so much to Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta, as well as to Ed Ludlow out in San Francisco. Now, we also want to bring your attention to some breaking news. We're getting some headlines out of John Kirby, the spokesman Further for the, the Pentagon, uh, who is speaking at the moment. He says a thousand troops in Germany will be moving to Romania, and the U.S. also will be moving about 2,000 troops from the U.S. The to State Europe Department within the coming the days. Those forces, he says, are being shifted in Europe. They are not going to Ukraine. They say the, the movements States are not 
permanent, but these are in addition to the 8,500 troops already on high alert. So we're getting those incremental upgrades, uh, updates on the situation on the border with Ukraine and the U.S. military response as a result. Now coming up, we will focus more on the markets, but geopolitical risk as well, as well as monetary policy risk. Bridgewater sees market turmoil on the Fed's hawkish turn, and we'll talk about that with Karen Carniel Tambor, Bridgewater co-CIO for sustainability. This is Bloomberg. Twelve minutes past the hour, live from London. I'm Guy Johnson. Kelly Lines, of course, in New York. In for Alex Steele. This is Bloomberg Markets. So let's talk about the markets. The world's largest hedge funds, hedge fund, says investors may be underestimating the need for aggressive monetary tightening by central banks, not only by the Fed but elsewhere as well. Bridgewater says the S&P could drop by up to 20% before the Fed blinks. Now, we've had a pretty aggressive move already in January. So where does that leave us in February? Uh, Karen Colonel Tambour, Bridgewater Associates co-CIO for sustainability, here to give us her take. Karen, great to see you. Um, wow, what a January. What did you learn in January and what does it tell us about February and the rest of the year? Hi, Guy. Thanks for having me. January has been, uh, I think, the month where investors started digesting that conditions are such that the Fed and other central banks are going to simply have no choice. They're going to have to act in the face of inflationary pressures. And we're entering a phase where very likely the economy is going to do fine. Um, there's just such a strong self-sustaining expansion that is with us now because the easing into COVID was so powerful across monetary and fiscal. But inflationary pressures, they're strong, they're entrenched, they're not just supply, it's also massive demand, it's massive demand outstripping supply. And the Fed and other central banks are simply going to have no choice but to withdraw liquidity out of the system. And withdrawing liquidity out of the system drags down assets, especially assets that are the ones that received all of the inflows. And what we saw in January is the market really uh, digesting that, that real liquidity withdrawal is upon us and trying to figure out how fast, how intense, how behind the curve is the Fed going to be versus how far is it going to let it run? So, Karen, do you think what we've seen is more just some froth coming off the top of those assets that have benefited from an ample liquidity environment? Or is what we've seen a market that is now preparing for some kind of growth shock down the line because of a Fed that tightens too quickly? I think that markets are currently pricing in not that much tightening. I mean, it's a lot of tightening relative to what we've experienced um, in recent years, but we haven't experienced anything like the inflationary pressures that we're seeing today. So the market is basically telling us the Fed is going to tighten what is a moderate amount relative to history, and that will be enough. They will stop at that point or they will cause a recession. And so they won't overdo it. They won't do more than that. Our view is, yes, the Fed is probably going to want to stay somewhat behind the curve. It doesn't really want to shut off the recovery. It wants to sort of you know, go slow, but they'll have to do a lot more than is currently expected, a lot more than is currently priced in, because it's not going to be enough to stop the inflationary pressures that we're seeing. So the Fed will kind of take a number of years to tighten into such a strong recovery and such strong inflationary pressures. And the markets are going to be proven wrong by just how much the Fed will have to do. They're starting to digest that this tightening will be difficult for risky assets. Um, but then again, they're not pricing in all that much tightening yet. Let's put some numbers on this, Karen. How high do you think the Fed is going to have to raise rates? Where do you think the terminal rate ultimately ends up being? You know, I think it is not wise to predict it because the Fed doesn't want to get there. If you listen to the Fed, they told us before it was this clear just how strong inflation was, you know, we want our inflation mandate to go both ways. They're becoming uh, more sensitive to the fact that when you have such a powerful expansion as you have today, um, and, you know, we have the labor markets as strong as we've seen them, that helps everyone throughout the whole economy. That actually gets to, you know, the bottom income groups really, really nicely. You have faster rising wages there. The Fed likes this, and they would really want to believe that uh, inflation will subside. And so there's a question between, you know, what they should do and what they will do. They will probably stay behind the curve. The economy will probably stay strong, self-sustaining, but they'll probably go a little faster than what you're currently uh, showing on the screen. And what's priced in is, I'd say, a lot for 2022 and basically almost nothing beyond that. The curve is extremely flat once you mm. get beyond the next 12, 
18 months. And I really doubt that'll be enough. Would the Fed still be behind the curve if it does indeed hike five times in 2022? Is that not enough for this year specifically? I don't think when they do these hikes that are priced in, and they might not do more than this in the next few months, they are going to look around and say, we don't have any more inflation. We don't have any more inflation. I think you have an economy. We have not seen this mix of cyclical and secular pressures on inflation at the same time in decades. And the turn towards um, you know, having supply uh, be so low relative to massive demand, I doubt that one year of you know, moderately normalizing policy will be enough to make that go away and that the Fed can you know, basically do nothing yep. uh, once we get to 2023. OK, so we've got a strong economy and a Fed that is going to continue to tighten. What do I do with that as an investor? So as an investor, the places that are most dangerous are wherever you saw a lot of excess liquidity go over COVID. And so, you know, you have the COVID response. It's a very unique response relative to what we've seen in history because you have both massive Fed money printing and fiscal policy at the same time. That's why we're getting the inflation that we're getting because it was so powerful to print money and put it directly into the hands of consumers through all the fiscal policies. Those consumers have both created massive demand and they bought a lot of things. And we know what they bought. They bought you know, certain tech stocks, they bought cryptocurrencies. These are areas where valuations are high. You had a lot of new entrants, even though some pressures come off now, that's where you see the most pressure as liquidity is being removed. What's most attractive for investors are places that, number one, are exposed to nominal growth, where you can say, whether it's growth or inflation that are strong, I believe there's a lot of fuel still in the system, and I want to gain from that. For example, commodities, commodity exposure, you get exposure to both strong growth and inflation. As the nominal economy is strong, you can get exposure to that. And most investors, the thing they lack the most in their portfolio is all that much inflation protection, very little inflation protection uh, for most investors that we see. The other places are places where you're looking and saying, look, a lot of money didn't go here during the boom and valuations still look pretty good. And if you look across the emerging market complex, you have different emerging economies where you say, you know, money didn't really go here during the boom. That looks very different than what happened in prior QE periods where money chasing higher yields ended up in a lot of emerging markets. Valuations are really good. It's very attractive to start investing in these countries. Um, places like, uh, you know, when you get geopolitical tensions like Russia that can scare investors from any emerging market of any type, those are great places to be. So you don't want to be parking your money in the U.S. in this kind of environment, Karen? Well, I would say that U.S. stocks are some of the least attractive relative to other stock markets in the world. So while I like having a stock allocation, U.S. stocks in particular are some of the most susceptible to liquidity removal, to where you've had bubbles build up in pieces. Valuations just look a lot better in a lot of other countries. So there's not a lot of reason to be there and not elsewhere. That's where all the flows have gone. Any reversal is better for other countries. And I think U.S. bonds are a terrible place to be because any increasing inflationary pressure, any pressure on the Fed to hike faster than is priced in, is going to hit the bond market. So there's a lot of attractive places to be. Most investors are mostly sitting over allocated to U.S. stocks and without almost any inflation protection. How much cash do you think investors should be holding right now? I think cash is uh, not going to be that attractive of an asset for a while. I mean, you're talking about you're still with pretty high negative real rates um, while people want some safety you know, you're you're losing real, uh, you know, spending power every dollar that you have in cash. Um, but when you get to how much cash to hold, you really do get to what are investors' particular circumstances? How much do they need the cash? How much liquidity are they relying on? What are the types of liabilities that they have and why? Karen, you've said a couple times now that what investors are lacking is inflation protection. How do you protect against inflation? What acts as that hedge? It's really important to remember that there are different types of inflation. And so being hedged well to inflation is usually a combination of assets that will protect you whatever type of inflation hits. Commodities, I'd say, is probably the most underutilized. Um, if you look at a broad basket of commodities and don't just end up you know, only holding oil, you're looking at assets that are going to do well as the economy grows and inflation pressures are strong. They have good and growth uh, exposure and very strong inflation exposure, and they're real inputs that we need in order to make any of the things that we want. Um, I really like metals. I also really like carbon credits because these are areas that not only are exposed to all the cyclical strengths, but also we have this big secular issue, which is we need to deal with climate change. There is um, a lot of political consensus all around the world that we need to do that. I don't know how PACE will do that. There are a lot of issues around that, but 
any acceleration in our desire to deal with climate change, we need to build electric vehicles, build solar panels. We've got to go build a lot of physical infrastructure that's going to be made of metals and the supply takes a really long time to come online. And so now you're talking about exposure to growth, exposure to these secular climate issues and exposure to all the inflationary pressures. In addition to that, for a lot of investors, just switching some of their nominal bonds to inflation linked bonds is an easy way to have an exposure very similar to what they have today that just instead of paying you a nominal coupon, it's going to pay you whatever CPI is. So if you don't want to have a big bet on exactly what inflation will do, just hold an instrument that will literally pay you CPI. And then, you know, gold is still a nice hedge against true debasement of the currency. Um, it's less of a good hedge against, you know, just a broad, strong economy. All right. Really great insight into how you are thinking about where to put your money in this market. Karen Carniel Tambor, Bridgewater Associates, co-CIO for sustainability. Thank you so much. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash, a look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Rishka Gupta. OPEC and its allies didn't need much time to decide what to do at their meeting today. They've agreed to increase output by 400,000 barrels a day in March. Still, if the past is any guide, they'll have to struggle to deliver. In November, the group only implemented about 60% of its increase. Members from Nigeria to Russia have been running out of spare capacity. Melinda French Gates reportedly will not give the bulk of her wealth to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That's according to Dow Jones. The billionaire is said to have made the change official late last year after her divorce from Bill Gates. She reportedly now plans to spread her fortune amongst various philanthropic endeavors. Happy days are here again for Wall Street rainmakers. Bonuses at U.S. investment banks haven't been this good in more than 10 years. Eight-figure pay packages are becoming almost standard for top performers. Goldman Sachs just spent an average 23% more per employee for the past year. That is the biggest jump in a decade. And that is your latest business flash. Guy. Rudika, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's, I, I want to talk about that bonus story because actually, Kaylee, I think it's interesting on the call last night with Alphabet, mm. they talked a lot about pay as well uh, and talked about the need to pay up for talent, pay up for brain power, basically. Um, they're looking for IQ. And, and that's the battle here. And that's what's changed yeah. here in so many ways. You've not only got a war for talent on Wall Street, but it's a war with talent with Silicon Valley as well. And Silicon Valley in certain areas is winning. Yeah, I think I was speaking with Shri about his story, Shri Natarajan, who wrote that Bloomberg Big Take this morning, and his whole thing was, this is no longer, I mean, Wall Street is kind of at the lower rung of the financial world pay spectrum at this point, because you have crypto billionaires, yep. you have all the wealth in Silicon Valley. It's a lot to compete with, Guy, and they're paying up to do so. We're going to talk about Ferrari a little bit later on. Mm. Makes you wonder, what kind of a year Ferrari's going to have going <laughs> forward? Quickly. We're going to talk about oil next, OPEC, the meeting. What do we learn from it? This is Bloomberg. Approaching 10.30 in New York, live from London, I'm Guy Johnson, Kelly Lines over in New York. This is Bloomberg Markets. So we're an hour into trading. Let's figure out where we are. Big tech certainly making its presence felt today, Kaylee. Abigail Doolittle here with the details. A good point, Guy, because it is all about big tech today. The Nasdaq 100 higher, but not surprisingly, we're seeing a little bit of intraday volatility, so we are off the highs. Now, one reason we're off the highs, Alphabet, which put up that monster quarter, it's off its highs not so long ago, up closer to 10%, now up 6.3%, still pretty solid. But given its big weighting to the Nasdaq 100, that big tech index up about four-tenths of 1% at this point. Nonetheless, that is, uh, I believe, the fourth up day in a row and the longest winning streak of the year. So impressive. We also have of Amazon and Meta platforms, and of course, Meta platforms, the old Facebook, up 1%. They report today after the bell. As for some other asset classes, let's take a look at bonds, because we do, of course, have yields in. That helps big tech as valuation becomes a little bit less of a concern. The, uh, not surprisingly, SIBO uh, NASDAQ index actually said not surprisingly. Last time I looked at it, it was down, but right now up slightly. So that speaks to that intraday volatility, the whipsaws, the uncertainty. And speaking to the idea, Kelly, that there could be a little bit of a risk off to uh, to come. Take a look at Bitcoin. It is down about 3%, not a huge decline, but 
technically, this uh, chart looks really pretty bad. It looks as though we could see a pretty decent decline. And last week or the week before, we looked at a bearish head and shoulders pattern that pointed to below 20,000. This is a six-month chart, and you can see a very strong downtrend. You can also see critical support taken out here. This area of congestion, it looks more bearish than not. If that breaks to the downside, it looks like we could probably see Bitcoin go to about 25, 20. This whole chart, Kaylee, actually confirms Bitcoin for closer to 10. If that happens, that would be a massive breakdown and probably a breakdown of risk sentiment. 10. That is brutal. Yes. Abigail Doolittle, <laughs> thank you very much. Bitcoin already down about 33% over the last two months. Now, in addition to Bitcoin, maybe you could call it a commodity, but we are watching another commodity, and that is oil. We're just getting the EIA crude inventory data out, and we did get a drop in crude stockpiles after two weeks of those moving higher. Crude oil inventories fell 1.05 million barrels. The distillate inventory is also down by about 2.41 million. We did get a build, though, in gasoline inventories, which rose by about 2.1 million barrels. And of course, this follows the OPEC plus meeting we got earlier today. Ed Moore, City Global Head of Commodities Research, is joining us now to discuss all of it. Ed, after that OPEC plus meeting, we just got the headline that UBS has now raised its Brent forecast to a 90 to $100 range. You're still at 79 for this quarter, moving lower throughout the year. If OPEC plus maintains this kind of discipline on the supply side, how much upside risk is there to that view? Well, I actually think that if you look at what the OPEC countries are doing, the OPEC plus countries are doing, they're not adding the 400,000 barrels a day per month that they have in their in their plan, but they are increasing it by more than 250,000 barrels a day per month. You stretch that across the 12 months of this year, and that's an increase of 3 million barrels a day of production. So um, I, I think it's, uh, it's misleading to say, hey, they can't do it. Some of them are out of capacity. They're doing a lot. 3 million barrels a day is a lot. We think there's going to be a good 3 million coming from non-OPEC countries as well. So uh, our, our outlook is slanted toward the bearish side because we just think this is an oversupplied market. And we'll be seeing that starting in the second quarter. Is Russia doing what it needs to do? I, there, are, there are other names I could mention as well. And, well, and we talk about what, what is being said that's being done and what is actually being done. Russia hasn't made its targets for the last few months. Uh, Russia has made its overall target, more or less. They haven't made it for the last few months. And it's a complicated story when you look be, behind the headlines on it. Uh, th their, their compliance record in terms of what they're supposed to do is about 106%. So they are not far from doing what they have to do. It's not much much different from the Saudi compliance record. It is a very different story from, say, Kazakhstan on the one hand, which is over, overproducing tremendously, or Nigeria on the other hand, which is barely uh, able to do anything other than see production decline. Uh, OPEC countries vary in what they can do. Russia in particular had shut down a lot of brownfield production focusing on Greenfield for tax reasons and uh, other factors, but they're now spending an incredible amount of capital to get that production back. And we have little doubt that between now and the end of the year, you add condensates to crude oil production and they'll be up a good million barrels a day. So uh, I think we, we ought to look at the bigger picture rather than just what's happened in the last month. And this month they claim that they're actually on target for what they're supposed to be producing. Well, Ed, let's talk about non-OPEC plus production then. We heard from Exxon and Chevron over the last several days. Exxon plans to burst Permian out, boost Permian output by 25% this year for Chevron, something like 10%. How do you factor shale into this equation? Shale is massive in this equation. We won't get back to where shale was producing at the beginning of 2020 until the end of this year. So that means that shale was really the as almost important a part of the rebalancing of the market from the oversupply of 2020 as OPEC plus was. We, we, were, we lost three years worth of production in, in effect. Uh, but now production is rising at a really rapid rate. And when we see these corporate reports coming in for the last quarter of the year and projections for this year, we're seeing an estimated increase in capital spending in the US of about 30%. Some people think that maybe that's uh, uh, countered by inflation. We don't think inflation in the oil industry is anywhere near the 30% increase in capital spending. So we have uh, calculated uh, about a million three at a minimum of liquid production coming out of the U.S. this year versus last year, about 800,000 a day of that coming from crude oil and the remainder from natural gas liquids. And with these new reports on increased capital spending um, and a movement away from the so-called discipline 
uh, that had uh, that Wall Street had applauded, and now Wall Street is applauding taking advantage of higher prices. We think our estimates for U.S. production are going to be on the low side when we come to the end of the year. Why is, why is domestic production been falling so much over the last few weeks? Um, it's down 300,000 barrels over the last three weeks, I understand. Does that number ring true to you? What is going on in the near term right now? In the near term, we call it winter and freeze-offs. So it's not unusual to see winter weather intruding in production. Uh, capacity has certainly increased. We know that from what happened before these freeze-offs took place. Uh, and we know that the Permian Basin uh, had gotten to its old record of March 2020 at uh, 4.8 million barrels a day, it was at 4.9 uh, uh, last month and expected to be 5 million a day this month. So I think it's noise and winter weather is part of the demand story. And it's also part of what's happening in shale at the moment. So but once we get past this, uh, and we have to remind ourselves that we had an enormous freeze off last February, which uh, shut in production, caused natural gas prices to skyrocket in the United States. Uh, oil was buffered by the oversupply and high inventories. Uh, this year it's not. So the inventory situation kind of exaggerates that for the high frequency data in the U.S., but it's, yep. it's really quite temporary uh, compared to where the recount is, which points to a much more robust yep. production future. Ed, um, final question. Um, my good friend and colleague, Amory Hordern, breaking a story out of D.C. That, that Washington and European capitals are, are talking to China, to India, to a range of countries about potentially providing gas to Europe were there to be an invasion of Ukraine. What is your assessment of the situation? How realistic would such a plan be? Uh, and how exposed is Europe right now to such a crunch? Well, Europe is exposed to such a crunch. And yes, the capitals are doing what they can to secure additional supplies of LNG to get into the European market. And they're succeeding by and large. And they're succeeding in part because China, which had gobbled up all of the remaining available LNG once they ran into power generation problems last September, is now releasing those cargoes. We're seeing a tremendous movement of LNG into Europe. They can probably get by if there is a crunch. We estimate that there probably won't be a crunch. When we look at Russian uh, exports, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, it's an intriguing situation because, yes, Ukraine is one thing and they've limited supplies through Ukraine. They've not limited supplies through the other four pipelines. And it's not in their interest. It's, it's in their interest to behave as they have been historically, to be reliable suppliers. The last thing in the world that they want to do is see an ability to see new supplies getting into Europe to cut their market share. So I think it's a lowish probability, but there is a buffer that, that's being worked out uh, through the LNG market, through Qatar, uh, and through the U.S. incremental uh, suppliers of LNG. Ed, it's always great to catch up. Perfect timing as ever. Ed Morse, City Global Head of Commodities Research. Sir, thank you very much indeed. We're going to carry on the conversation relating to what is happening uh, around and in Ukraine. Uh, the top White House cybersecurity official uh, has been traveling to Europe, around Europe, in Brussels, talking to the EU, talking to NATO about how to respond to potential Russian cyber threats. We're going to talk to a man who founded the first cybersecurity firm ever. Shlomo Kramer is going to be joining us. Cato Networks, that conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishka Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Tune in to Bloomberg's monthly series, The Chief Future Officer. The latest episode featuring Macy's CFO Adrian Mitchell is now on Bloomberg.com and on YouTube. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Rishka Gupta. New figures indicate that private sector payrolls in the U.S. fell by 301,000 in January. That comes from the ADP National Employment Report. Earlier, the White House said that brief absences of workers due to Omicron could overstate the number of unemployed people for the last month. The January jobs report comes out on Friday. And in the euro area, inflation surprisingly speeded up to a record in January. Consumer prices jumped 5.1% from a year ago. None of the economists surveyed by Bloomberg saw inflation accelerated 
It's the latest challenge to the ECB's plan to pare back stimulus more slowly than its counterparts in both the US and the UK. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Kaylee. Ritika, thank you. Well, let's get to a Bloomberg scoop. The U.S. wants to ensure that Europe doesn't run out of energy if Russia invades Ukraine. Bloomberg has learned that the U.S. and its European allies have approached China and other major natural gas importers in Asia about sending their fuel to Europe. Bloomberg Washington correspondent Anne-Marie Hordern helped break this story, and she's joining us now. Anne-Marie, is this just backup contingency planning, or is there a feeling that this may actually have to be implemented? No, it's certainly right now back of contingency planning. And even if Russia was to invade Ukraine during the height of the Cold War, those flows never actually stopped. But there is a worry about Europe's dependence on Russia. More than 40 percent of their natural gas supplies comes from Russia. And if the U.S. wants a harsh sanction package alongside their European allies, they're doing what they can to try to help alleviate some of these pains. So while we also reported uh, a few weeks ago they were talking to Qatar, we now know they're also talking to other gas suppliers like Libya and Egypt and Nigeria. But the issue in the natural gas market is a little bit different than, say, the oil market. They have long-term contracts and not a lot of spare capacity. And these long-term contracts go to a lot of Asian countries. So what would need to happen is similar to what we saw in 2011 with Fukushima. So in, if you are going to, a, a shipment is going to, say, Japan or South Korea or India and even China, we know that Biden mm -hmm. administration officials and EU officials are approaching Beijing on this. They could potentially use their own storage that they have built up and send that shipment instead to Europe. What I find so interesting is that there does seem to be some outreach between Beijing officials and Washington officials and some, at times, uh, agreement when it comes to the energy space. We saw that with the SPR. Now we're seeing this again potentially uh, on this Russia invasion if there's supposed to be supply disruptions potentially in Europe. Potentially also it will be a little bit tricky for Vladimir Putin who heads to Beijing on Friday. Winter Olympics coming up. Yeah, you wonder how that Xi Putin chat will go if that's the, the backdrop to all of this. Mm. Great reporting, Amory. Fantastic work. Bloomberg's Amory Hordern breaking that story for us. Um, the US and NATO trying to figure out exactly how prepared they are right now. Gas, just one element of the story. The other is what is happening in cyberspace. Cyber attacks, certainly a feature of the landscape in modern warfare. The top White House official for cybersecurity, and Neuberger, is on a tour of Europe right now. She's been meeting with NATO allies, uh, meetings in Brussels with both NATO and the EU. Uh, with us today to talk about what she is likely to find on the ground in Europe is one of the founders uh, of the world's first cybersecurity company, Checkpoint Software. Shlomo Kramer is now the founder and CEO of Cato Networks. He joins us now from Tel Aviv. What do you think Anne Neuberger is going to find? Welcome to the show, Shlomo, by the way, and thanks for joining us. What do you think thanks Anne Neuberger is going to find when, she, when, she, when to, she, she goes around Europe? She's going to find the, uh, that the uh, geopolitical uh, attacks are going to be part of uh, modern warfare, and that, that's inevitable, uh, right? So uh, the, the, uh, the main issue here is how do we... Uh, how do we prepare towards that, right? And uh, actually, there's, uh, you know, uh, three pillars here that, that really uh, matters in uh, uh, coping with this inevitable uh, uh, effect. Uh, one is better protection. And, uh, you know, I'm speaking as one of the founding members and 30-year and veteran of the cyber market. Mm. And I have to say that the cyber market is broken. And it hasn't uh, provided with kind of the backbone of the economy, the small and mid-sized uh, organization with the appropriate uh, capabilities to protect themselves uh, against uh, uh, geopolitical attacks. And, and be, that's because all of the investment, all of the new widget uh, went to the Bank of Americas of the world. And the, the regular businesses uh, need uh, a, an iPhone, uh, right. uh, a so cyber iPhone, not a cyber... Uh, Shlomo, if I could weakest. just interject here, you're talking about defense. Are we weakest on defense or offense in terms of a response to cyber attacks? I would say that, the, you know, the, the offense, this is asymmetrical. Uh, so, so the offense is going to happen. It's like 100 years ago asking if, you know, artillery is going to influence. Mm -hmm. It's going to influence. It's going to be effective. 
The main question is how are we raising awareness to the fact that it's going to come and, and be prepared. And there are areas where uh, awareness is amazingly behind. Look at the colonial pipeline, for example. It's a, a basically critical infrastructure is under uh, protected. And even the consumer with NSO out there, still what percentage of the viewers have a, a mobile security uh, solution on their, uh, on their mobile uh, device? So absolutely the, the difference uh, is the issue here, but there's also another issue that, that has to be addressed uh, uh, as soon as possible. You know, this uh, geopolitical attack and the offense is not only effective, but it's the most disruptive weapon since the atomic bomb. And, and some would say even more so. It definitely uh, influences mostly civilians. Uh, and yep. the, the, there's no treaty to, uh, uh, to address it. There's no agreement what is war crime and what is legitimate. So this yep. is really an urgent uh, need as well. Shlomo, what is Russia's capability here? How effective is Russia? How much damage could Russia do if it decided to go down this road in, road in a big way? Russia is, is, is famously very capable in, in, in their uh, uh, offensive uh, uh, capabilities. Um, and, and the question is, you know, how strong are the defences? And, and uh, unfortunately, we haven't prepared ourselves as, as well as we should have. Where does that responsibility lie, Shlomo? Does it need to be on private companies who have these vulnerab vulnerabilities, or is this on governments to do more? I, I would say both, both. The, the market needs uh, to recognize that in order to pro provide uh, a protection, uh, this is not only the Bank of America, but uh, also the, kind of the, the, the vast majority of the market. And there needs to be a, a raise in awareness. And this has to be through regulation that forces awareness and through other means. And obviously, a treaty is, is something that has to be a government. So I would answer both the, the, the public market as well as the, uh, uh, the government. Does critical infrastructure in Europe, given the risks that we face, need to be A, hardened, and I'm assuming the answer to that is yes, but B, taken offline. I, what, are there easy solutions here? Uh, and I appreciate they're probably not easy. Yes, but yes, can they you, are, they are, can they you are, separate? Yeah. There are solutions. And there is a segment of the cybersecurity market called uh, operational technology uh, uh, security, industrial cybersecurity. And it must be adopted much more broadly. And it's not. And it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a question of awareness and investment and regulation that forces uh, that to, to happen. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the situation. There's a gap here mm. that is uh, dangerous. Shlomo, we only have about a minute left, but what is the next biggest threat in your view? You know, the threats are, are everywhere. So the the cybersecurity is always about the next uh, uh, layer of defense. But I would say that the biggest threat is the fact that uh, the, the, the backbone of the economy is unable to protect itself. And the proof for that is if a, a, a mid-sized business tries to get a cyber insurance policy, it would cost them 10 times now than it cost uh, three years ago. So this is the, the number one, uh, I think, uh, uh, task uh, for protection, the broad a, a fat waste of the economy. All right, really, really valuable insight. Thank you so much to Shlomo Kramer, founder and CEO of Cato Networks, for joining us as the situation with Ukraine and Russia unfolds. This is Bloomberg.
From London, I'm Guy Johnson, Kelly Lines over in New York. This is Bloomberg Market. So let's talk about the price action over here in Europe. Equities bid 4.77 on the stock 600. We're up by another six tenths of 1%. The rally off the lows continues. The real action, though, I think is elsewhere. Foreign exchange and what's happening in the bond market, really the story right now. Um, Euro sterling, I think, kind of encapsulates the story here in Europe. We've got inflation data out of Europe. We'll talk about that out of the Eurozone in just a moment. Stronger than anticipated. Is the ECB going to hike as is priced right now? How much further will the Bank of England go? Does that pair continue to sell off? But then I think you get to the real story, and, and that is digging deeper into what is happening with the ECB. The German two-year, now negative 45. We're inside the negative 50 uh, that the ECB's key rate has. Uh, and that tells, tells a story, and a signal is sent. Maybe the ECB is going to deliver some hikes this year. Certainly priced. Simon French, chief economist at Pamela Gordon, is going to be talking to us next to debate this very issue. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg. 